the executive. Oh, <laughs> okay. I think now we're starting. Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Small. I'm one of the deputy executive officers at the Coastal Conservancy, and I'm here with Julian Nesbitt, who's our Civic Spark Fellow. And this is a webinar um, on our project selection criteria update. Uh, we gave the exact same presentation about a month ago. So if you attended that, um, nothing has changed. We are still in the public comment period. Uh, the format for this presentation, uh, I'll give a very brief introduction, then Julian's gonna go through the proposed update, and then there'll be a lot of time at the end to take um, comments and respond to people's questions. And we're really interested in getting comments in writing so that we are sure we can uh, incorporate those comments into our response. And so I'll, on our website, there are, there's both an email address and an anonymous comment form. And we'll give you that information again at the end. We'll have it posted. So the project, the Coastal Conservancy's project selection criteria um, are really high level concepts that are written in a way that they apply to the broad range of projects that the Conservancy does. So everything from, you know, in replacing culverts to improve fish passage to coastal public access projects to urban greening projects. So they're very, very broad concepts. We've had project selection criteria for more than 20 years. Uh, and we use them to communicate our priorities to both potential applicants and project partners um, and to evaluate grant applications and select and recommend projects for funding. And over the years, we have periodically updated the project selection criteria, but this is one of the more comprehensive updates um, that we are in process working on right now. And I'm gonna just turn it over to Julian to go through that in more detail. Thank you, Mary. So as Mary said, I'm, I'm Julian and I'm the Civic Spark AmeriCorps Fellow with the Conservancy. And so this is one of my main projects, updating the criteria along with Mary. And so we've had multiple reasons to do this right now. And one of the big ones has been to update it under the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Guidelines or JEDI Guidelines that the Conservancy adopted back in September of last year. And basically it's being updated to reflect those JEDI guidelines that address our funding programs, meaningful community engagement, and working with California's tribes. And it's also a great opportunity to align our criteria that's related to climate change with current state policy and guidance. And lastly, it's a great way to clarify, consolidate, and clean up the criteria, which will allow the Conservancy to apply the criteria more consistently. All right, and then we have two kinds of criteria. First off is the eligibility criteria. And so basically these criteria, all projects are required to meet them. Now, some of the SEC's past criteria have been moved to eligibility criteria because projects, again, must meet them. For example, one of them is if the project is consistent with the funding source. So it's logical to make that something that's required for all projects. And then our second kind is the selection criteria. So this is where they're not all required, but they're used to prioritize our projects. And there are multiple pathways to meet that criteria and increase your likelihood of getting accepted by us. All right, and so here are the eligibility criteria in full. So you have, again, consistent with the purposes of the funding source, be consistent with the conservancy enabling legislation, compliance with CEQA, grantee capacity. So does the grantee have the ability to administer the funds or have they partner with someone who can site ownership slash control? So the grantee has or will have the legal right to carry out the project on the land where they're trying to carry it out. And then long term management. So there is a plan for long term management, maintenance and monitoring of the project after the end date. And then we have the proposed selection criteria. So these again aren't required, but they use to prioritize who gets funding from us. So first off, we have the extent to which the project helps the Conservancy accomplish our objectives in the strategic plan. Then we have number two, the product is a good investment of state resources. So is it feasible? Is the budget reasonable? Things like that. Then we have it being sustainable or resilient over the project lifespan. 
And so that's most related to our climate change criteria. And so that's been brought in to ensure that, again, the project benefits are sustainable or resilient, and you apply appropriate current projections to issues like sea level rise based on the project's lifespan. Then number four is the project delivers multiple benefits and significant positive impact. But this describes both natural resource and community benefits. And more concrete examples of how projects could benefit communities, improving public health and creating jobs and things like that. And then our last two are the two new criteria that are especially related to our JEDI guidelines. So number five is the project was or will be planned with meaningful community engagement and broad community support. And number six, the programs and projects implement tribal engagement wherever possible. And so we expect that you have different levels of engagement based on what kind of project we're dealing with. And so tribal engagement, especially though, should have some effort put into it because all projects are on previous tribal lands at the end of the day. Unmute. Okay, so here are a couple of questions that we've gotten a number of times. So I'll just get those out of the way. And then we'll move on to take questions from um, people participating here. And also if you have comments you wanna give us. Um, the first one is that there's been some confusion around CEQA. We've made uh, CEQA an eligibility criteria, but that doesn't mean that the conservancy, uh, the conservancy will still fund planning and like fund of an, an EIR, or we've often funded the CEQA compliance. And the act, a project where we're funding the CEQA compliance, like planning is usually exempt from CEQA. So we can file an exemption. Um, so that has caused some confusion, but it's not changing what we will fund. This has always been a requirement for conservancy funding. Um, when our board authorizes a project, we need to make CEQA findings. So it's it was trying to clarify that. And then the second question we get a lot is sort of, what if the selection criteria don't really apply to my project? You know, as I mentioned, removing a culvert with a bridge in some remote part of the state, there may not be a lot of meaningful community engagement. And we recognize that not all of the selection criteria will apply equally to all of the projects. Um, but the idea was to raise up those big concepts from our JEDI guidelines, from the sort of agency's priorities and put those out there so that to the extent that they do apply people will be thinking to integrate them into our project. As Jillian said, you know, all projects, there is an opportunity for some level of tribal engagement because they pretty much all are occurring on um, former tribal lands. So now um, written comments are due on July 1st and we really encourage written comments because then we'll be able to um, incorporate a response to those in, in the final criteria and you can send them two ways. One is to email them to jedi at scc.ca.gov or if you go to our website and you find the link for the project selection criteria, there's an anonymous comment form there if that's more comfortable for people. And then now we are happy to take any comments or questions from people here. I think that the way this is set up, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can actually see people. Um, I think that you have two options. You can raise your hand and we can unmute you um, if you want to give a comment verbally, or you can type into the Q&A box and we can read your questions and answer them. Or, so if anyone has any comments or questions, you can either raise your hand um, or type into the Q&A box. I'm not, oh, Mike Hastings, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Julian. Thank you for doing this. Um, appreciate the guidance as always, definitely having worked with the Conservancy for quite some time now. Um, I kind of know the answer to this, but um, just want to bring it up and, and see if anything's changed. I know that commitment to long-term monitoring and maintenance um, is often a component outside of the grant funds. 
Um, but I deal in the world of coastal estuaries and um, they're tech pretty much down here in Southern California, all to a certain degree, a managed system. So acquiring that long-term commitment outside of grant funding is not always easy. Um, it's a conservancy by any chance, um, looking at opportunities to work in partnership with nonprofits or different groups to establish those long-term monitoring and maintenance, either through an endowment, um, through funding directly from the conservancy or potentially um, similar to the work plan is, is acknowledging that it's an important and a priority and then looking to work with to find funding from an outside source. Oh. Oh, I'm on you. That's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you. Um, that's a really great question. And, um, you know, a, a fair, it wasn't quite a critique of the Conservancy, but it would be a fair critique of us. Um, a lot of our funding, unfortunately, isn't able to go towards monitoring um, and isn't around for a long, for the long term. But I think we absolutely recognize that it's a really important element of our projects and making our projects successful. So to your second part of, you know, are we willing to partner on trying to find that funding and making funding available when we can? Absolutely. Um, it's just that like a lot of the bond funds we can't use um, for long term monitoring. And there's a question in the Q&A confirming that the um, that the deadline is July 1st. Oh, I think Julian's already answered that. Um, Bill Keene says that I've read the JEDI guidelines appears to be a priority for workforce development that achieves equity and diversity. How will this be measured, applied, evaluated for projects? Uh, for example, if there's a project that meets the solicitation goals, will there be priority for projects that also achieve get JEDI goals for workforce development? Julian, do you want to take that one? Or do you want me to? Um, I can try. Yeah. So, yeah. So, how is we measured? Has applied? Has evaluated? Um, yeah. So, we recognize that different projects are going to have different scopes. So, it might not always be able to go all the way with achieving the equity and diversity goals if it's something that's based mainly on natural resources. And we do take that into account, definitely. And at the end of the day, it's just show effort in it. And that's where the, again, the tribal like acknowledgement especially comes in handy because of course it's important to acknowledge the tribal lands that you're on and figure out how to do some consulting with tribal groups potentially. So that's like the main way I'm thinking of that. Hope that helps answer that. And I would just add in, I mean, Julian mentioned it in his presentation. One of the big changes, I think, in the in the JEDI guidelines is that we have always done multi-benefit projects, but we are, you know, as an agency, as we do this, this work on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, thinking about community benefits a little bit more broadly. So I, I mean, I think the direct answer to Bill's question is that, yeah, if there were two projects that met a solicitation goal, but one had really great workforce development um, and one didn't, we would prioritize the project that also had that workforce development community benefit. Um, that is part of what we're trying to signal, signal through this update. Okay, are there any other questions? I'm going to put back up the um, I'm going to put back up the way that you can comment if I can. Um, so there's two ways for written comments. We're really eager to get written comments on these guidelines. Does anyone else want to comment before we wrap up? This was a very short. Okay, well, thank you for your interest. Um, and again, we are really eager to hear from people. 
So um, please send us your written comments. Oh, Mike raised his hand again. Sorry, I know this is uh, probably already out there. Can you provide a link um, through the text where I could find those guidelines? I, I know they're on a web page somewhere, but I appreciate if you have the link available. Yeah. That would be can more efficient for me. Can you do that, Jillian? Or I might have, link? To, I have to stop sharing my screen to do that. Yeah, I can get it up. Yeah. You got it? Awesome. That's Thank idea. both of you. Yeah. Almost there. And this, this is a link to where to submit the public comment? No, where the guidelines are, I think. Oh, the guidelines are, I got it. Yeah. Yes, the, the guidelines. Thank you for clarifying that, Mary. All right. And Mary, someone else has raised their hand now. I see that, yeah. Dave, let me see if I can unmute. Why don't you go ahead while... Um, Thank you. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks for thanks for the webinar. You guys appreciate you making the time for this. Um, I represent the Redwood Coast Land Conservancy in Wallala, California. Uh, we are working with the uh, Coastal Conservancy and, and very much appreciate the support uh, by Lisa Ames and, and others of in the organization for our work uh, in developing the Millband Preserve. We are very much interested and have been seeking energetically over the last several years uh, ways to engage the, uh, the local bands of the Pomo tribes. Uh, this is a, the Point Arena Manchester uh, band as well as the Kashaya band. And in spite of a number of efforts um, at various levels, we have not been successful in, in, in this engagement effort. Uh, I note that Criteria six, which, uh, which we philosophically align with completely and have been doing our best to, to again make contact and not just contact, but engagement in a variety of ways to implement the project. And we're just not, we're not, the wheels continue to spin. We're not getting any traction. Uh, Lisa's aware of, of this dilemma um, and, it, and it continues, it's quite persistent. The language of the draft is written, however, mandates that the project includes, it uses very specific directive uh, language that uh, while I think ideal, does not um, really recognize the fact on the ground that, that tribes have discretion and they, they are either inclined to engage or able to engage or, or not. And there really is nothing that an applicant like a 501c3 nonprofit can do to compel tribal engagement uh, in any way. So how do we work with a situation with a criterion that is really quite directive and, and explicit in inclusion when in fact we are not, we don't control that at that outcome? I think that's a really good comment and um, I am making notes and I, I would encourage you to put it in writing too if you don't mind, but because I think that that's, um, Tribal capacity is is obviously a huge issue and and varies a lot within the state and and it's certainly tribal engagement is something that I think all state agencies and definitely the Coastal Conservancy is still learning how to do. Um, and so I think that, as Julian said in his presentation, what we're trying to signal is that the effort is really important. Um, and I think that, you know, speaking for our own efforts, we don't necessarily expect everyone to get it right the first time. I think that this is an area that is actually really, it's hard to do well. And that what we're trying to do is to get everyone making efforts and learning how to do it better and addressing, you know, I think the state as a whole is also trying to address the, the capacity on the on the tribes side as well um, because there have been so many initiatives now that that a lot of tribes are feeling a little overwhelmed um, and so I I guess my I don't have an exact response to you but I think that it's a really good comment as we finalize these guidelines to figure out how we can indicate um, that we understand that it is that it's hard to do to achieve, you know, the highest level, if that makes sense. Thanks for your candor. I will, uh, we'll, we'll explore an appropriate way to articulate this in writing. Okay, thanks.
going to give it just a minute to see if anyone else has any questions or things they want to talk about today. Going once. Okay. Um, well, thank you again for taking the time. Um, and Julian, you were, were you able to post the? Yeah, I did. Okay, great. Um, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye.